Now, in my, this is my opinion. This is four supplements that everyone with gluten sensitivity should take, kind of bar none. If you're not working with any kind of doctor at all, if you're just saying, okay, what can I use or what can I take to cover as many bases as possible without any kind of testing? Again, this is just, um, this is just general based on my experience. And the first is a high quality multivitamin, multimineral. So a multivitamin, multimineral is number one. And the reason why is a multivitamin, multimineral will cover your basic fundamental bases, meaning it's gonna cover you know, all of your vitamins, your fat soluble vitamins, your vitamin C, your B vitamins. It's gonna cover many of your primary minerals that are commonly deficient. So it's gonna give you kind of a basis or a baseline for this. Again, it's not gonna be high enough in certain things if you have major deficiencies, which is why it's so important to get tested, but it is gonna give you kind of, think of it as food insurance, okay? Number two on the list is an omega-3. And I mentioned that this is probably the fifth most common deficiency I see in people with gluten sensitivity. It's very, very common. And one of the reasons why with gluten, with gluten sensitivity, one of the primary side effects is fat malabsorption. As a matter of fact, fat malabsorption is one of the tests that many GI doctors will run to help them understand um, whether or not they need to go further and look for celiac disease. So a lot of doctors actually look for markers of fat malabsorption. And so what we see with fat malabsorption is, remember, omega-3 is fat. So is vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin K, all fats, right? And so fat malabsorption leads to fat deficiency, these are fats, so you're gonna malabsorb your omegas as well. But this is a very, very common one. And if we're, and if we're talking about quantity of an omega-3, because they come in all different shapes, sizes, flavors, etc., you're looking at, in my opinion, you know, the average adult, two grams a day. And that should, that should be um, an almost even split between two types of fat. There's usually with these, there's EPA, and then there's another compound called DHA. These are the, these are the active omega-3 fats. And so it should be close to an equal split. It may not be exactly an equal split, but it should be close to an equal split. So you know, approximately a gram of DHA and a gram of EPA a day to get those levels you know, to, to, a, to a place where they're, where they're helping support you. Another is probiotics. And here's one of the reasons why the probiotic is something that I recommend. There's a lot of research coming out now, a lot of research. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm getting ready to present on this, on antibiotics, you know, one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in the world today, antibiotics. Okay, now antibiotics have side effects. And one of them has to, has to do with increasing the risk of celiac disease, of actually developing celiac disease. A number of studies have now shown that this is something that we believe pretty strongly, that the earlier you have antibiotic usage in your life, the greater at risk you are for developing celiac disease. In essence, for, for, for the gluten to damage your gut to a level that inflames it and destroys the villi, leading to malnutrition. Okay, but something else that antibiotics do is a very common side effect is they cause a yeast overgrowth. Very, very common. Now, yeast overgrowth is a very, very common situation for somebody who's gluten sensitive and just starting the diet. A lot of people have this yeast overgrowth. And in, in part, a lot of people have this because they've had a history of antibiotic use that were part of the trigger for their, for their gluten issue. But some people have it because they overconsume carbohydrates, and we all have healthy yeast, a healthy amount of yeast in our guts, but when we overfeed them, we increase their numbers, creating an overgrowth. Now, there's science that shows that yeast, so if we look at yeast as a microorganism, they produce something called an HWP. That stands for hyphal wall protein. HWP is a type of protein. It's, it's um, Yeast commonly produce it, and this protein cross-reacts with gluten, so it mimics gluten. And so what happens is sometimes a person goes gluten-free, but if they also have a yeast overgrowth, they have this excess quantity of hyphal wall proteins being produced by the yeast. This protein mimics gluten, so their, their body is behaving like it's still getting exposure to gluten, which is causing gut damage and GI damage, which is leading to malnutrition. So 
This is one of the reasons why probiotics is on the list. I went through that long and drawn-out explanation to come back to why I recommend probiotics. Probiotics, first of all, my philosophy is first do no harm. So like if you're going to do any kind of supplementation at all, we want to first do things that we know won't hurt you. And all these things are super safe. For pre There's no contraindication really for any of these things for anyone. Uh, the only contraindication of any of these is omega-3. If you're getting ready to go have a surgery, most of your doctors will want you to discontinue an omega-3 because it can keep the blood thin. And when they're doing surgery, they don't want your blood to be too thin so that you bleed too much during the procedure. But that's really the only contraindication for taking omega-3 you know, at, that, at that level. So again, very, very safe, won't do any harm. But if you have that history of antibiotic use, or you have that yeast overgrowth, what probiotics do is they actually create competition for the yeast. So, so remember, your, your gut's like a garden. You've got weeds and you've got crops. You want your crops to grow and yield good, healthy things for your body to utilize, right? So think of your antibiotics as your, as your uh, not your antibiotics, but think of your probiotics as your, your healthy crop that's going to bring fruits and, and, uh, and vegetables and other things to you. And think of yeast as the weeds that are snuffing out those things. Okay, so this will create competition. So if you do have a yeast overgrowth, at the, at the very least, it's going to create competition and help maybe potentially control that. Okay, but number two, these probiotics, what a lot of people don't realize, especially lactobacillus and bifidobacter, these are two of the main ones that have been studied. We're now learning that these probiotic deficiencies, low levels of these strains of probiotics actually also increase the risk for developing a gluten reaction or gluten sensitivity. So if you come back to what we said, antibiotics increase the risk for celiac disease. One of the reasons why is they can cause a yeast overgrowth, but another reason why is they knock out your good bacteria, which has also been linked to the development of a gluten issue. So probiotics, very important. Then we have digestive enzymes. And one of the reasons I recommend digestive enzymes is because as, I, as I've already laid out to you, most people with a gluten sensitivity, when they, when they learn about it, or if they have celiac disease and get a diagnosis, their gut's damaged. And what, what's damaged? The villi. Where, and where do many of the digestive enzymes come from? They come, they're produced by the cells of the GI tract. So if your gut's damaged, your gut's producing less digestive enzyme, that means that when you eat your food, you're gonna break it down less efficiently. And remember, why do we need to break our food down? What are we trying to get at? We're trying to get at the vitamins, the minerals, the omega-3 fats, and the other healthy nutrients from the food. And if we lack digestive enzymes because years of gluten damage has destroyed you know, and damaged the gut, then how are we gonna get the nutrition from the food we eat? Again, we've taken the gluten out but does the gut fully repair if the nourishment coming into the gut isn't capable of being broken down and digested? So a digestive enzyme is a very good place to start. Um, so with digestive enzymes, what you, what you really wanna look for is you wanna look for something that's somewhat full spectrum, like it has multiple types of enzymes in it to break down fat, carb, as well as protein. So something that can help break down all three of what, what we call the macronutrients uh, to support that breakdown. So again, this is, this is if you do no testing, right? A high quality multi and omega-3 probiotics and a digestive enzyme because probiotics and a digestive enzyme can help you improve your gut health, okay? Which will help your gut get more from the food that you eat. And in the long run, we want you to get more food or more nutrients from the food that you eat. Why? Because ultimately, you shouldn't have to rely on fistfuls of pills to maintain your health. You should really have a good functioning gut that can process food well and it can extrapolate the vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients from food so that you're well nourished. But this is a really good place to start. And if you've never had any testing done, this is a really good place to stay until you get your doctor to run some tests. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.